Warning, the following video may contain scenarios and language of a highly adult nature. If you were under the age of 18, stop what you're doing, which is watching this video, and watch something else. Also on my channel, but not one of the other videos in this uh, series. Viewer discretion is advised. Hey, what is up guys? This is Couch Potato Mike coming to you from the book club for chapter 35 of Freed by E.L. James. Before we start reading chapter 35, 35 of Freed by E.L. James, I want to remind you guys to subscribe, ring the bell icon, and give me a thumbs up because it helps out with that YouTube algorithm. I am so close to 300 subscribers I can taste it. And remember, at 300 subs I'm doing a giveaway. So... Look for, looking forward to that. So without further ado, let's just go ahead and jump right into chapter 35, which takes place on Tuesday, September the 13th, 2011. I hang up from my phone conversation with my mother and catch Anna's monochrome eye. She's gazing down at me from my office wall with her disarming smile, her eyes bright and brimming with intelligence. It's only been three hours since I saw her, but I miss her already. I wonder what she's doing right now. She's probably at work, and if all has gone to plan, Ray should be settled into his room at Northwest Hospital, where my mother will keep an eye on him. I hope he's comfortable, or as comfortable as he can be. He seemed to enjoy the flight from OHSU to Boeing Field, but he's not a man who likes to be the center of attention. Quite the opposite, in fact. A little like his daughter. And here I am, missing her. Last time I saw her, she was heading to the hospital in an ambulance with her father. I glance at my watch. She'll definitely be at work. I type a quick email. From Christian Gray, subject missing you, September 13th, 2011, 1358, to Anastasia Gray. Mrs. Gray, I've been back in the office for only three hours, and I'm missing you already. Hope Ray has settled into his new room okay. Mom is going to see him this afternoon and check upon him. I'll collect you around six this evening, and we can go see him before heading home. Sound good? Your loving husband, Christian Gray, CEO, Gray Enterprises Holdings, Inc., I press send, then open the report on my desk and start to read, but almost immediately the ping of a new email distracts me. Anna? No, it's Barney. From Barney Sullivan, subject Jack Hyde, September 13th, 2011, 1409, to Christian Gray. CCTV around Seattle tracks the white van from South Irving Street. Before that, I could find no trace, so Hyde must have been based in that area. As Welch has told you, the unsub car was rented with a false license by an unknown female, though nothing that ties it to the South Irving Street area. Details of known GEH and SIP employees who live in the area are attached, are in the attached file, which I have forwarded to Welch too. There was nothing on Hyde's SIP computer about his former PAs. As a reminder, here is a list of what was retrieved from Hyde's SIP computer. Gray's home addresses. Five properties in Seattle, two properties in Detroit. Detailed resumes for Carrot Gray, Elliot Gray, Christian Gray, Dr. Tra Grace Trevelyan, Anastasia Steele, Mia Gray. Newspaper and online articles relating to Dr. Grace Trevelyan, Carrot Gray, Christian Gray, Elliot Gray. Photographs, Carrot Gray, Dr. Grace Trevelyan, Christian Gray, Elliot Gray, Mia Gray. I'll continue my investigation, see what else I can find. B. Sullivan, head of IT, GEH. I gaze at the contents of his email and wonder when Hyde started scouring the internet for information on my family. Was it before Anna started working with him, or was it after he'd met me? I'm about to pen a response to Barty when Anna's reply to my earlier email pops into my inbox. From Anastasia Gray, subject missing you, dates September 13th, 2011, 1410, to Christian Gray. Sure, X. Anastasia Gray, editor, SIP. Oh. Feeling a tad deflated, I glance at the enigmatic, smiling goddess on the wall. I thought we might indulge in some email banter. She's normally so good at that. This is not like her. From Christian Gray, subject missing you, September 13th, 2011, 1414, to Anastasia Gray. Are you okay? Christian Gray, CEO, Gray Enterprises Holdings, Inc. While I wait for her reply, I sift through the address file that Barney has attached to his email. A couple of GEH employee names and one from SIP jump out at me. 
The highest profile name is Elizabeth Morgan, the HR director at SIP. Her name stirs something in the back of my brain, but whatever it is, it remains elusive. I'll ask Welch to follow up on her when next we speak, but it's hard to conceive that any of these people could be involved with Hyde. I dismiss that train of thought and wonder what's up with Anna. I'm tempted to pick up the phone and call her, but as I reach for it, another email arrives from her. From Anastasia Gray, subject missing you, September 13th, 2011, 1417 to Christian Gray. Fine, just busy, see you at 6, X. Anastasia Gray, editor, SIP. Of course she's busy. She's missed a few days of work, and my girl is nothing but conscientious. Gray, keep it together. I go back to Barney's email and read through his list one more time. It doesn't yield any further insights, but maybe he can answer a question for me. From Christian Gray, subject Jack Hyde, September 13th, 2011, 1423, to Barney Sullivan. Barney, thanks for the email. Can you track when Hyde began these internet searches? Christian Gray, CEO, Gray Enterprises Holdings, Inc. I check the time. I have to catch up with Roz. Taylor and I wait for Anna outside SIP. I glance anxiously toward the entrance, hoping that she'll be out at any moment. An email alert appears on my phone. From Barney Sullivan, subject Jack, Hi Jack Hyde, September 13th, 2011, 1735 to Christian Gray. Internet searches on the topics in Hyde's emails happened between 1932 Monday, June 13th, 2011, and 1714 Wednesday, June 15th, 2011. B. Sullivan, head of ITGEH. Hmm, interesting. I remember I'd met him the Friday before at the bar when I'd arranged to meet Anna. He was a loud-mouthed asshole then. I wonder if he was looking for anything specific on my family, and if he found it. I glance out of the window and finally Anna appears. She dashes toward the car, dodging the rain, Sawyer at her heels. I smile as I watch her, but my heart sinks when she glances into the car. Her face is a stark alabaster in the grain. Shit. In the gray rain. Sorry. Shit. Sawyer opens her door and she slides in beside me. Hi? The inflection of my voice is tentative. What is it, Anna? Hi. Her eyes flick to my face briefly, too briefly, and all I see is her turmoil flashing back at me. What's wrong? She shakes her head as Taylor pulls in into traffic. Nothing. I don't think that's true. Is work all right? Yes, fine, thanks. Her tone is clipped. Tell me. Anna, what's wrong? My words are harsher than I intend as they're loaded with my anxiety. I've just missed you, that's all, and I've been worried about Ray. Oh, of course. Thank God. I brighten immediately. Ray's good. I try to reassure her. I spoke to Mom this afternoon, and she's impressed with his progress. I reach for her hand. It's freezing. Boy, your hand is cold. Have you eaten today? She flushes. Anna? Why does she do this? I'll eat this evening. I haven't really had time. I rub her hand in an attempt to warm it. Do you want me to add feed my wife to the securities details list of duties? I catch Taylor's eyes in the rearview mirror. I'm sorry, I'll eat. It's just been a weird day, you know, moving dad and all. I guess. She turns away and stares out of the window, leaving me to flounder. Something's not right. It has been a weird day. Take her at her word, Gray. I give her my news to test the water. I may have to go to Taiwan. Oh, when? This gets her attention. Later this week, maybe next week. Okay. I want you to come with me. Her lips thin. Christian, please, I have my job. Let's not rehash this argument again. I blow out a breath, unable to conceal my disappointment. Thought I'd ask. How long will you go for? Anna's voice is soft but distracted. This is not my girl. She's too quiet and hesitant. Not more than a couple of days. I wish you'd tell me what's bothering you. Well, now that my beloved husband is going away. Her voice fades as I raise her hand to my lips and kiss her knuckles. I won't be away for long. Good. She gives me a thin smile, but I know she's preoccupied. I gaze out of the window and through several scenarios that might be bothering Anna. Only one rings true. Her father has just been in a major accident and his recovery will take some time. Yes, that's it. Gray, get a grip. Raymond Steele is happy to see us. Can't thank you enough for organizing all this. He waves at the airy room, his dark eyes full of quiet sincerity. 
Ray, you're most welcome. Uncomfortable with his gratitude, I changed the subject. So you have a stack of sports magazines. For Manny, I've been reading about the Mariners and the se this season they've been having. Ray launches into a diatribe about how disappointed he is with the M's this year. I have to say I'm with him. It's not been a stellar season. Our conversation moves on to fishing. He's sorry to miss out on his angling trip to Astoria, and I mentioned recent fishing expedition to Aspen. Roar and fork. I know it, he says. You should come and stay, maybe for a weekend, once you're up and about. I'd appreciate that, Christian. Throughout our discussion, Anna is quiet. Too quiet. She's turning it. She's tuning out and going elsewhere. It's frustrating. Anna, what's wrong? Ray yawns. Anna glances at me, and I know it's time to go. Daddy, we'll leave you to sleep. Thanks, Anna, honey. I liked that you dropped by. Saw your mom today, too, Christian. She was very reassuring. And she's a Mariners fan. She's not crazy about fishing, though. Don't know many women who are, eh? Ray's smile is wary. He needs to rest. I'll see you tomorrow, okay? Anna kisses his forehead, and there's a trace of sadness in her voice. Hell, why is she sad? Come, hold up my hand. Is she tired? Maybe what she needs is an early night. Anna was quiet in the car and quiet when we got home, and now she's just chasing her food around her plate with her fork. Tassa turned and distracted. My anxiety has climbed to DEFCON 1. Damn it, Anna, will you tell me what's wrong? I push my empty plate away. Please, you're driving me crazy. She turns, apprehensive eyes to mine. I'm pregnant. What? I stare at her as a frisson of disbelief skitters down my spine. And for some unknown reason, I'm suddenly at the door of the skydiving plane, hanging over the world without a parachute, about to leap out. Into the air. Into nothing. What? I don't recognize my voice. I'm pregnant. That's what I thought you said, but I thought we took care of this. How? She tilts her head to one side and raises a brow. Fuck. Anger like I've never felt before erupts inside me. Your shot? I snarl. Did you forget your shot? She just stares at me, eyes glassy as if she's looking right through me and says nothing. I don't want kids. Not yet. Not now. Panic knots in my chest and tightens around my throat, feeding my fury. Christ, Anna! I bang my fist on the table and stand. You have one thing, one thing to remember. Shit! I don't fucking believe it. How could you be so stupid? She closes her eyes and then stares down at her fingers. I'm sorry, she whispers. Sorry? Fuck! A child. What do I do with a child? I know the timing's not very good. Not very good? My bellow echoes around the room. We've known each other for five fucking minutes. I wanted to show you the fucking world and now... Fuck! Diapers and vomit and shit! I close my eyes. You won't love me anymore. Did you forget? Tell me, or did you do this on purpose? No! Her word is a quiet rush of denial. I thought we'd agreed on this. And I don't give a fuck who can hear me. She cringes, folding in on herself. I know, we had. I'm sorry. This is why. This is why I like control, so shit like this doesn't come along and fuck everything up. Christian, please don't shout at me. Fuck. I'll be displaced. She starts to cry. Don't you dare, Anna. Don't start with the waterworks now. Fuck. I run a hand through my hair, trying to comprehend this colossal fuck up. You think I'm ready to be a father? My voice cracks in the last word. She turns a tear-filled eyes to me. I know neither one of us is ready for this, she mumbles. But I think you'll make a wonderful father. We'll figure it out. How the fuck do you know? My voice clamors around the room. Tell me how! She opens her mouth and closes it again. Tears stream down her face. And there it is. Her regret. Regret that's writ large in every feature of her face. Regret she's saddled with me. I can't bear it. My fury is drowning me. Oh, fuck this! I rage at the world and back away, holding up my hands in defeat. I cannot do this. I'm out of here. 
Grabbing my jacket, I storm out of the room, slamming the foyer door. Frantically, I stab the call button, and even though the elevator is on our floor, the doors take far too fucking long to open. A child. A fucking child? I step into the elevator, but in my head, I'm underneath the kitchen table in a shambolic, grimy, neglected hovel waiting for him to find me. There you are, you little shit. Hell and damnation. Fuck no. On the ground floor, I slam the main doors out of a scala and onto the sidewalk. I drag in a lung full of fresh fall air, but it does little to assuage the anger and fear that surge in my equal measure through my veins. I need to get away. Instinctively, I turn right and start walking, barely noticing that it's stopped raining. I walk and walk in a daze, concentrating on the simple act of placing one foot in front of the other, blotting out all other thoughts except one. How could she do this to me? How? How can I love a child? I've only just learned to love her. When I look up at Flynn's office, there's no, there's no way he's going to be there. The door doesn't shift. It's locked. I call him to get his voicemail. I don't leave a message. I can't trust myself. Jamming my hands into my pockets of my jacket and ignoring the commuters on the street, I trudge on, aimless. When I look up, Elena is locking up the salon, shrouded in her usual black attire. We gaze at each other. She's on one side of the glass, I'm on the other. She unlocks and opens the door. Hello, Christian. You look like shit. I stare at her, not knowing what to say. Are you coming in? I shake my head and step back. Gray, what are you doing? Somewhere deep in my subconscious, an alarm is sounding. I ignore it. Elena sighs and taps a scarlet nail against scarlet lips, her silver ring catching the evening light. Shall we go for a drink? Yes. The mile high? No, somewhere less crowded. I see. She tries and fails to hide her surprise. Okay. There's a bar around the corner. I know the one. It's a quiet place. Let me grab my purse. Standing on the sidewalk while I wait for her, I feel numb. I've just walked out on my pregnant wife. But right now, I'm too mad at her to care. Gray, what are you doing? I shake the disquieting voice from my head and Elena steps out of her salon, locks the door, and with a slight nod of her head, indicates right. I jam my hands farther into my pockets and together we walk the rest of the block around the corner and into the bar. It's had a considerable makeover since I was here last. It's no longer a dive, but an upscale watering hole, all paneled wood and plush velvet seating. Elena was right. It is quiet except for Billie Holiday's soft, melancholic voice over the sound system apt we slide into a booth and elena signals for the waitress good evening my name's sunny what can i get you folks i'd like a glass of your willamette Pin pinot noir and elena says a bottle i order without looking at the waitress elena's eyebrows rise a fraction but she maintains her familiar air of cool detachment maybe that's why i'm here that's what i'm looking for cool detachment personified Coming right up, the young woman leaves us. So, all is not well in the world of Christian Grey? Elena observes. I knew I'd see you again. Her eyes are fixed on mine and I don't know what to say. Like that, is it? Elena fills the silence between us. Did you get my text? On my wedding day? Yes, I did. I deleted it. Christian, I can feel your enmity from here. It's coming off you in waves, but you wouldn't be here if I was your enemy. I blow out a breath and sit back in the booth. Why are you here? She asks, not unreasonably. Fuck. I don't know. Could I sound any more sullen? She's left you? Don't. I give her a glacial stare. Don't want to talk about Anna. Elena purses her lips as the waitress returns. We both sit back and watch as she uncorks our wine and pours a sample into my glass. I'm sure it's fine. I wave in Elena's direction and the waitress fills each of our glasses in turn. Enjoy, she says brightly, leaving us with the bottle. Elena reaches for her glass and raises it. To old friends, she smirks and takes a sip. I snort, feeling some of my tension leaving my shoulders. Old friends... I raise my glass and gulp down a few mouthfuls of wine, not tasting it. 
Alina frowns and presses her lips together but says nothing, her eyes not leaving mine. I sigh. She wants me to fill the silence. I'm going to have to say something. How's the business? Good. It was a generous of you to gift it to me. Thank you for that. It was the least I could do. She glances down at her glass as the silence between us expands. Eventually she breaks it. As you're here, I think I should apologize for how I behaved at your parents' house. Well, this is a surprise. It's not like Mrs. Lincoln to apologize for anything. Her mantra has always been never apologize, never explain. I said several things that I regret, she adds quietly. We both did, Elena. It's in the past. I offer her more wine, but she declines. Her glass is still half full, while mine is empty. I pour myself another. She sighs. My social circle is considerably diminished. I miss your mother. It hurts me that she won't see me. It's probably not a good idea for you to get in contact with her. I know. I understand. I never meant for her to overhear us. Grace was always most fearsome when it came to protecting her brood. She looks wistful for a moment. We shared some good times, though. Your mother knows how to party. I don't wish to know that. Helena laughs. You've always placed her on such a pedestal. I'm not here to talk about my mother. What are you here to talk about, Christian? She cocks her head to the side and runs a scarlet nail around the rim of her glass. I see blue eyes on mine. I shake my head and take another long draft of the Pinot. Has she left you? No! I snap. If anything, it was me who walked out. What kind of man walks out on his pregnant wife? Hell, maybe my father was right. His words come back to haunt me. It's about you. You live it up to your responsibilities. You being a trustworthy and decent human being. You being husband material. Maybe I'm not husband material. I shake off the thought as Elena gazes at me and I know she's trying to work out what's wrong. You miss it? A lifestyle? Is that it? The little woman not giving you what you want? Fuck you, Elena. I don't have to listen to her bullshit. I start to slide out of the booth. Christian, don't go. I'm sorry. She reaches for my hand, then changes her mind, so her outstretched hand becomes a fist on the table. Please, don't go, she pleads. Two apologies from Mrs. Lincoln in such a short time. I settle back into my seat, warier. I'm sorry, she says once more for emphasis, then tries a different tack. How is Anastasia? She's good, I answer eventually, and I hope that I haven't given anything away. Elena narrows her eyes. She doesn't believe me. I exhale and confess. She wants children. Ah, Elena says as if she solved the riddle of the Sphinx. This shouldn't be a surprise to you, though I will say she's a little young to be producing your spawn. Spawn? I scoff, because she's said the last word with such malicious invective. Elena's never wanted children. I suspect she doesn't have a maternal bone in her body. Baby Grays, she muses. That will put an end to your predilections. She looks amused. Or maybe they've come to an end already. I scowl at her. Elena, shut up. I'm not here to discuss my sex life with you. I drain my glass and pour more wine for both of us, finishing the bottle. The Pinot Noir is beginning to work its magic. I'm already feeling hazy around the edges. It's not a sensation I normally enjoy, but right now, I welcome the oblivion that beckons from the bottom of my glass. I signal the waitress for another bottle. Has she done something specific to upset you? I haven't seen you drink like this in years. Elena sounds most disapproving, but I don't give a fuck. How's Isaac? I ask to move the focus to her lover and away from my wife. My marriage is none of her business. She half smiles and folds her arms. Okay, I get it. You really don't want to talk. She pauses, and I know she's waiting for me to spill my guts, but my secrets are mine, not hers. Isaac is fine, she continues finally. Thank you for asking. In fact, we're really good at the moment. She launches into a tale of their latest sexual escapade, but to what end, I don't know. I half listen and half let the wine carry me away. So, is it the business? Is that your issue? She asks when I don't react. No, it's going great. I bought a shipyard. 
She nods, impressed, I think, and I refill both our glasses from the latest model and give her a rundown of what I've been doing at work. The solar-powered tablet, the fiber-optic business takeover, Gia Lamera, and, of course, the shipyard. You've been busy. Always. So, you're talkative about business, but not your wife. And, is this a problem? I knew you'd come back, she whispers. What? Why are you drinking so much? Because I'm thirsty, and I want to forget how I behaved two hours ago. She regards me through half-closed eyes. Thirsty, she breathes. How thirsty? She leans in and reaches over, taking my hand. I tense as her fingers slide under my palm and beneath the cuff of my jacket and shirt, her fingernails digging into my flesh over my pulse. Maybe I could make you feel better. I'm sure you miss it. Her breath is stale, not sweet like Anna's. Her hand tightens around my wrist and from nowhere the darkness circles my chest and starts spiraling into my throat. It's a feeling I haven't experienced for a while and now it's back, amplified, echoing through my body and screaming for release. What are you doing? I squeeze the words out. It's tightening its hold on me. Don't touch me. This is how it was, always. Me fighting my fear as she laid her hands on me. Don't touch me! I withdraw my hand from hers. She pales and frowns, her eyes on mine. Isn't that what you want? No! That's not why you're here? No, Elena, no. I haven't thought about you like that in years. I shake my head, wondering how she could have so badly misread my intentions. But my thoughts aren't as clear as they should be. I love my wife, I whisper. Anna. Elena studies me, her formerly pale cheeks reddening with the wine of embarrassment or both. She frowns and looks down at the table. I'm sorry, she mutters. Apology number three. My cup runneth over. I don't know what came over me, she laughs, but her laughter is loud, forced. I have to go, she gathers her purse. Christian, I wish you and your wife well. She stops and looks me squarely in the eyes. I miss you, though, more than you know. Goodbye, Elena. The way you said that has a finality about it. I don't answer her. She nods. It would be difficult. I get it. I'm glad you came to see me. I think we've cleared the air. Have we? Cleared the air about what? Us? There is no us. Goodbye, Mrs. Lincoln. I know it's the last time I'll ever say these words to her. She nods. Good luck, Christian Gray. She slides out of the booth. It was good to see you. I hope whatever it is that's bothering you sorts itself out. I'm sure it will. If it's about being a dad, you'll do great. She tosses her sleek hair over her shoulder and exits the bar without a backward glance, leaving me with a half-empty bottle of Pinot Noir and an uneasy feeling of guilt. I want to go home to Anna. Shit. I put my head in my hands. Anna will be mad as hell when I get home. Grabbing the bottle and my glass, I head toward the bar to settle my tab. There's a stool free, so I sit down and replenish my glass. Waste not, want not. I nurse my drink slowly. Hell. I hate it when Anna's mad at me. If I go home now, I may say something else I'll regret. Besides, I've had too much to drink. And I don't think Anna's ever seen me drunk. Of course, I've seen her drunk. The first night I slept with her at the Heathman and the night at the bachelorette party. Her words float through my slow, intoxicated brain. Are you going to punish me? Punish you? For getting so drunk. A punishment fuck? You can do anything you want to me. Stop, Gray. I wonder when she got pregnant. On her honeymoon? In our bed? In the red room? Fuck! Junior. We'll need a fucking minivan. Will he have Anna's blue eyes? My temper? Shit. My glass is empty. I refill it, finishing the bottle. There will be hell to pay if Anna ever finds out that I had a drink with Elena. She loathes Elena. Christian, if that were your son, how would you feel? Oh, Anna, Anna, Anna. I don't know what to think about that. Not now. It's too raw and too painful. I need oblivion. 
I want to forget who I am and how I've behaved the way I used to before everything, before Mrs. Robinson. The barman looks my way. Bourbon, please. And apparently he drinks until at least midnight. Because that's where this chapter just ended. Wow. Gotta admit, you always wondered how that went. I know I did. Fucking bitch came on to him. Nails and everything. Crazy shit. Well, the next chapter promises to be hell on earth. Hell on wheels. The shit is really gonna hit the fan. And I can't wait. But unfortunately, we're going to have to until next time. So for the Couch Potato Mike YouTube channel, this is Couch Potato Mike reminding you guys that in the end, we're all stories. So let's make them good ones. See you next time.